Asgard's Wrath has definitely lived up to the hype that it's been building for months due to its extremely long amount of gameplay, customization options, and multiple styles of play. So with so much to cover today guys, we're going to be breaking down 20 things I wish I knew about Asgard's Wrath in the form of giving you guys 10 tips for beginners and 10 tips for advanced players. So whether you've just begun the game, haven't purchased it yet, or have been playing at least for a few hours hours, this video should help you out. This kind of content is made possible by channel members, Patreon supporters, and our sponsor over at VR Wave. More about them in just a bit. Now without any further ado, let's dig into 20 things I wish I knew about Asgard's Wrath 2. We're going to be getting into the beginner tips first and moving on to the advanced tips in the latter half of the video. So starting off with number one in the beginner tips, you can bring your hands up close to your face to see the controller map. Now this can be handy if you're new to VR or new to more complex VR games like Asgard's Wrath 2 where there's a lot more going on with the controller and button combinations on screen like using them for the puzzles that you do in your deity mode. This can be handy because now instead of lifting up the face mask in order to see what buttons are which you'll be able to just bring your hands close to your face and see exactly which ones they are because it also lets you know which individual fingers are hovering over which buttons so you can actually use this to help you learn the button map if you're new to VR. Now, I know many players won't have this issue, but that's exactly why it's number one on the beginners section. Number two, you can use the relics pretty much freely because they are not bound. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up because as a beginner to this game, I did not know this. I did not understand that once I put a relic on an item that I could actually switch it out for another relic. The game didn't do a lot to actually explain this concept to you as soon as you started using the relics. However, this means you you don't have to play as cautiously as you thought you might have to, collecting up a bunch of relics and then trying to save them to stack up a specific effect or something in that nature. No, with this game you can actually just equip whatever relics to whichever character you have as long as you have them for that character, which we'll talk about the multiple character aspects here in just a moment, but as far as equipping them and trying to stack up effects, this is something that you can do very easily and very freely, so don't worry about spending relics too cautiously as you can just use the ones you would like like to use in the moment. Number three, switch the axe to your dominant hand. Now the axe is naturally placed in your left hand, but as most of you are probably right-handed, I would suggest switching that axe over to your right hand in your inventory menu. Now I suggest this for many reasons, primarily because the game presents the axe as if it is a secondary weapon, but as the axe is used in a lot of puzzles and it's the throwing item, I say put it in the dominant hand so it's easier to access and you become more fluent with throwing the axe as that's one of the primary ways to use this weapon. In addition, having it bound to your dominant hand means that you're going to draw a lot quicker and it's not a weapon that you can equip to your back even though you have two back equip slots. So only being able to equip it to your hip means that you're going to want to use it like a quick draw weapon of sorts and because it's your ranged weapon you're going to want to get to it much quicker. The swords are all quite easy to get to as you can draw them from your back or your hips making it kind of fast if you get into a close quarters combat situation but with that axe you're gonna want to be able to throw it a lot and very quickly so I say put it on your dominant hand Number four, the ghosts of other players can actually be quite helpful. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, a few hours into the game, you're presented with the ability to be able to leave behind a specter of sorts for other players to see. Now, naturally, this is just a fun little add on to the game, similar to like Dark Souls or something where you can leave behind a revenant for other players. However, the reason this is useful, just like it is in Dark Souls, is because if you use the emojis that your characters can equip and present to other players, then basically what happens is players who've come across a particular area before can actually use this emoji to point you in the right direction or show you little secrets to puzzles. Now this is a luck of the draw type of thing of when you're online and when you're seeing people's specters and all that good stuff, but if there were some pretty helpful players that came along before you, you can definitely see this with their ghostly forms that have left behind little extra clues for each of the new players to each new area. And if you're one of the players that's cool enough to do this for other players, then let me say thank you to everyone who's come 
come after you. Number five, turn on the aim assist in your item and settings menu. Now, the reason I'm going to tell you to go ahead and turn this aim assist on, because not only does it save you a lot of time, it will actually help you learn to throw the ax because it will show you kind of the targeting system that you'll be using for the majority of the game. Throwing the ax is quite simple and intuitive, but if you're new to VR and you're afraid of lobbing your remote into a TV or something of that nature, then you can definitely turn on the aim assist, which will not only increase your proficiency in combat, but it'll make the game go a little quicker and decrease the possibility of any accidents in the living room area. Now, besides all of those benefits, turning on the aim assist can help with your arm getting tired and having to throw these big crazy tosses at enemies if you're having to do that, because basically it turns it to being just a bit of a flick of the wrist to throw your axe to kill enemies. Number six, upgrading the axe more is probably more beneficial than upgrading almost any other weapon in the game, especially if you're a beginner or early on in the first couple of hours. Now you don't get to start upgrading items right away as you just get perk points about an hour to an hour and a half within the game as you begin. But once you do get that ability to start upgrading the weapons themselves, upgrading your abilities, I would say put a lot of your effort into upgrading the ax because it's going to be used for a majority of the game. Not only this is you're going to want to equip it just to have it for puzzles and lots of other extra uses that they built in for you to use with this ax. Over time, the ax can be thrown and controlled mid-air in addition to being able to leave behind additional blades as it's being thrown and just all sorts of extra powers like going through multiple enemies. Now, this is just something that makes it way too handy and useful to use, especially over something like the sword that just doesn't throw very well and is mainly used for up close combat. The ax itself is more of a multi-tool being used for puzzles, up close combat, far away combat, and everything in between. So I would definitely say if you're curious about which weapon to put your effort into first, the ax is a solid bet. Number seven, the game actually has two sides to the whole thing and what I mean by this is of course there's a storyline and an online version of this game so what they've done is made it to where the storyline is played by the main character of the game the scorpion king looking dude and while you're online you're going to be playing your godly form now this means that both characters have their own inventories their own abilities and their own relics to equip to run each side of this game you can use the godly form and the dungeon crawler aspect of the game that puts you online and allows you to basically run endless dungeons to farm for materials to send over to the storyline of the other side of this game. This makes it to where you can play Asgard's Wrath online or offline, all depending on how you like to play. You can actually play through the entire storyline without really dipping into the online version first, or you can unlock only the online point, play the game up to where you up unlock that, and then only play online a bunch of times. Either way works, as the game is designed to balance out being able to play either side, whether it be the story mode or online. Both are pretty satisfying, but I gotta say the story mode kind of has my attention right now, at least until I beat it, which means playing the online version or the Rift version of this game will be much better once I've beaten the storyline to the game, I'm assuming. Number eight, collect all items before you anticipate that a fight is coming up. For example, if you enter an area that you say, ah, oh, this area is uh, quite awfully big, there might be a boss battle coming up, then you might want to go around the area before the boss battle starts if possible and destroy all extra items, collect all extra items, do all that extra stuff because once you enter the boss fight, these are less items that you're going to be interacting with. For example, if you're throwing your ax at the boss or in a particular area and you don't have aim assist turned on, you might end up throwing it towards one of these extras sitting around the battlefield where you plan on fighting this boss or this horde of enemies. The last thing you want when fighting a bunch of enemies is for your weapon to be getting thrown into barrels, bushes, or other items items instead of into your enemy. So definitely make sure you loot areas first and then fight your enemies, whether that be the bosses or hordes of monsters. 
Number 9. The Panther Mount can be used in combat. Now, my first playthrough of this game, or at least a good first chunk of the few hours that I had the Panther Mount, I didn't really think about using it as a combat weapon, as I generally just turned the Panther back into the Cat Lady so that she could help me fight enemies. However, later down the road, I did start using just the Panther to run into enemies, and I found out that you can actually still fight while on the back of the Panther. You can still throw your axe, throw your sword at things. However, you're not going to be very good at up-close melee combat. So what this is good for is running into an area, knocking all your enemies over, throwing your axe into them, and then when one of them finally does hit you, you will be dismounted. So it's possible to kind of stay on the panther and fight enemies, and it makes it a lot easier to stun them and knock them down. Number 10. You won't really have to use any items until you beat the first two or three chapters of this entire game. In fact, if you're playing as a beginner, unless you're on hard mode or something like that, then you won't really need items at all through a majority of your playthrough. In fact, potions and even upgrading gear can almost be pointless unless you're playing on a harder level because you're kind of just interacting with a story mode version of the game. Now that's not to say that doing these things isn't inherently fun and that you shouldn't do them. I'm just saying that you probably won't need to for a majority of this game. Now once you bump up the difficulty level, you'll definitely start using your potions and crunching more items into upgrading weapons and whatnot. But if you're just looking to play the story and see what all the hype is about, then you won't really have to worry too much about this aspect of the game. So don't let the overcomplicated nature of this particular VR game confuse you or dissuade you from completing it, as you won't really need to do as much if you're playing on just the story mode version. Hey guys, let me interrupt this video real quickly to talk about today's sponsor, VR Wave. VR Wave makes prescription lenses for your VR headset, and if you're like me and you play lots of MMOs, this is going to be extremely helpful and more comfortable for your overall VR experience. Now how this works is they take your glasses prescription and then shrink it down into a lens that you can magnetically clip to the inside of your VR headset. This makes it highly easy to remove and clean these lenses on both sides. In in addition, they provide lenses for blue light sensitivity and astigmatism. So guys, if you're looking for a better visual experience in virtual reality, then go ahead and hit up VR Wave today and use my code Red Devil Studios to get 5% off. Now let's get back into the video. Now we'll be moving on to the advanced tips. Now these tips are for if you've been playing for a few hours or maybe you've even beaten the game and you're gonna play through it one more time. Either way, I hope these are helpful to you guys. Let's dive right into number one and that's using the map always. Now these tips are designed to cut down on your playthrough time and to just kind of cut through all the BS that is the story mode or that is extra dialogue through the game so that you can actually get to rarer items or tougher foes a lot quicker. So why leave leave the map on all the time. Leaving the map on all the time takes out the guesswork of the game and allows you to cut from A to B very quickly, in addition to using the map to fast travel from point A to point B, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But leaving the map on allows you to always see where your target goal is and make it there very quickly. And if you're trying to do a speed run, this is definitely a helpful tactic. Advanced tip number two, stay charged up. Staying charged up basically just means keeping your weapons charged. Now, early on in the game, I didn't know I could do this for every single weapon set that you get, but you indeed do. So what you're gonna wanna do is as you run around, if your weapons are not charged, just occasionally raise your hands above your head, charge those bad boys up and keep them that way. This reduces the amount of time you'll be playing the game overall as you kill many, many enemies much quicker over time, increasing the damage output of your character. Imagine that you just forget to charge up a few times and how many more enemies you've killed without this charged attack, increasing the total playtime. So if you want to do a speed run once again of any kind, you're definitely going to keep your weapons charged up. And if you're just curious about damage output and keeping it at its maximum, you're going to want to do this as well. Advanced tip number three, back to the map, you're going to not just always leave the map on, you're going to always use the map for traveling. This basically means every single time the game wants you to go from one point to another, instead of walking there, if it seems like it's pretty far because you've left your map on, you can actually see the distance from point A to point B, whether you're close to it or not, and if you're not, you should definitely start using your fast travel as a habit. This will definitely reduce the overall time that you'll be spending on this game, allowing you to beat it much quicker. The reason I list these map things in the advanced tips is because if you're a new player, you might lose 
lose sight of it while you play in the story mode, getting lost in that story or in the awe of the vast landscape that is within this game. But overall, if you remember playing things like Skyrim, you'll remember how useful fast travel can be. And especially in a VR game like this, fast travel is going to help you chop through a lot of the BS and get straight to storyline points and overall get better loot a lot quicker. Advanced tip number four, you have to build up all of the weapons and armors to get to the better weapons and armors. Now, once you get to the point where you can unlock the actual blacksmith that will be giving you these upgrades, you'll notice that you need pretty much the previous weapon armor set to upgrade to add materials to make the next one. You can skip around a few of these, but for the most part, saving up materials for stuff later won't really work as you'll need to play through the game to actually access those materials. So wasting time trying to upgrade early things can be detrimental in some areas, but when it comes to the armors, you'll kind of want to go ahead and just knock some of these out as it looks like you'll have to upgrade certain armor classes to be able to access higher tiers of armor. Doing this early on kind of gets it out of the way and frees up a little bit of inventory space for stuff that you don't need to be holding on to for that long. And you'll be able to access the higher armors at the different levels of this game as you complete quests and challenges, increasing your character's level over time. Advanced tip number five, the physical relics are probably the most reliable relics in the game. Now, I didn't say most useful, but definitely the most reliable as a lot of enemies will take physical damage. And once you start equipping elemental relics, you do decrease the possibility of doing damage in certain areas to particular enemies that might have an increased defense against that particular relic. For example, if you enter a fire-based area and you're using fire-based relics, you might not be dealing as much damage as you'd like to. If you don't really want to think too much about messing with your relics, equipping a majority of physical relics is going to be the best way to go as it's going to allow you to just keep increasing your physical and damage stat over time without really having to worry about what kind of elemental ability you're applying right now to this particular area or that particular enemy. This allows you to relax and just run through the game beating the living hell out of everything in front of you advanced tip number six don't waste too much time on early builds of your character now this isn't to say early builds of armor as we mentioned a moment ago but early builds of your character if you're too worried about surviving the very beginning of the game then you probably should put it on easier difficulty but for the most part you don't need to worry about building up your character within the first few hours of the game i'd say get way past unlocking the blacksmith and then worry about applying stat upgrades and and weapon upgrades and relics to your character because up to that point the game is pretty easy and straightforward and then you can kind of see what you're working with with how many resources you have for not only your stat upgrades and relic upgrades and armor upgrades etc but you'll kind of get how the game works up to this point and which of these combat styles is actually going to suit you the most whether that be the up close hand-to-hand -hand combat or the ranged axe throwing style combat that the game presents you with in addition you have to understand that this game is going to be giving you different weapons throughout the game on different styles so you'll have to prepare a character for that if you dump all of your stat points and all of your materials into a particular character build early on you might be stuck with that character for a while and not be capable of being flexible with the different variety of weapon types later on in the game that's not to say you won't be able to equip those weapon types or use them but if you want to get the most out of a particular weapon then you might save your stat points for it Advanced tip number seven, upgrade your followers and don't neglect their armor or friendship statuses. Upgrading your followers over time is actually going to be a great way to breeze your way through this game as they give you a lot of help whether you need it or not. They will be able to help you chop through the hordes and waves of enemies in addition to actually having to use the followers for a lot of puzzles throughout the game. So upgrading them is just a good idea. Leaving them bare for a majority of your run of the game, you'll actually miss out on on a lot of things that the follower system has to offer, like the friendship and stat system that comes with it. Upgrading your follower's armor is kind of a no-brainer, and I shouldn't really have to speak to a lot of the benefits of increasing the stat points of your followers, but it's just something that can be easily forgotten as it's buried under a lot of the menus that you have in this game, with a lot of the features that the game offers as well. That's not to say that this is a bad thing, it's just there's a lot to take in, and as a even advanced player, I've 
seen some people go through several hours of this game without paying any mind to the characters following them around. Advanced tip number eight, dash to dodge. Now this is pretty simple and intuitive in most other VR games, but this VR game kind of presents a dash as just a quick way to get forward and backward with your movement to run to the next area as it doesn't allow you to run or jump in most particular instances unless you're doing some of the free running parkour type stuff, which is all kind of just a press A and follow sequence interaction. Now advanced players know that you can use this dash and a directional button on your thumbstick to basically hold it sideways or backwards to dash in and out of the way of enemies letting you dash backwards and then forwards very quickly in combat to deal extra damage now if you're doing this with the axe or sword you'll probably end up cutting most of the heads off of your enemies or cutting them in half allowing you very quick kills just maintain how many dashes you're using to be able to pull off these skills they do recharge pretty quickly so forgetting to use the dash in combat is kind of something that you can definitely do as a beginner as there's a lot going on but but once you get used to the controls, it's something that becomes kind of second nature. Advanced tip number nine. This one is pretty important. Now, I've talked a lot about using the axe in the combat system of this game and how useful it actually gets, but now we'll be talking about controlling that axe in midair. Now, learning to do this is one of the most important skills in the game, in my opinion, as it is just too useful. Once again, throwing this axe allows you a lot of versatility, but throwing it and controlling it in midair with the LD buttons allows you to basically basically turn it into a crazy, crazy weapon for whether you're outdoors or indoors. It automatically targets flying enemies, and if you're stuck within a tight space, you can kind of just slingshot this thing all around the room to not only to break every item in the room and discover all the secrets the room has to offer, but also turn it into basically a booby trap of buzz saws for any enemies coming near you, and you still have your sword that you can draw on for close combat. So you can basically throw the axe out and use it to zigzag a path of blade all over the place allowing enemies to run straight through them before they get to you and then you can use the axe in mid-air to kill pretty much any flying enemies in addition to bringing it straight back down onto the ground-based enemies this thing is basically Thor's hammer if you learn to control it correctly and on top of increasing all of these stats for the axe as we've talked about before and leaving it charged up this makes the axe one of the best possible weapons throughout the game to use and one of the most most reliable for sure and finally for our last advanced tip pet the panther okay pet the freaking panther so what I mean by this is every time you summon that panther in order to use it as a mount or bring her into combat turn the character back into the panther and give her a little pat on the head doing this often or at least every time that you use the panther mount will increase the friendship status of the secondary character and unlock additional bonuses which I won't spoil here but you're definitely going to want to do this a lot over time. Making it second nature or a quick habit will allow you to unlock that friendship stats very quickly and get to those extra perks right away. Well guys, that was 20 things I wish I knew about Asgard's Wrath before diving into it, and I hope this video was entertaining and helped you guys with some new tips on how to play Asgard's Wrath 2, as there are a lot of things you kind of just don't catch on to until you've played for a few hours. And hey guys, if there's anything that you think would be a great tip for other players, then go ahead and drop it in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for checking out this video don't forget to check out my sponsor over at vr wave if you need some vr lenses and want a better visual experience in virtual reality thank you guys so much for a great 2023 i'll see you in 2024 happy new year everyone